still no intro. No. Uh, do we need one? Couldn't hurt. <laughs> What what what? Would... Maybe our intro could just be us punching our mics. Uh, sure, just like in I'm rhythm. Gonna, I'm just gonna like keep beating it like I'm yeah. cocky. You Speed know? bag it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe do that. Yeah, but until then, still no intro. Um, what would our intro be? Uh, got the cough, not the COVID. Um, I don't know what, what? You, you know. You're, please, you're always, please keep going. You're always saying like, oh, you cough, and then you're like, it's not COVID. So, like, I mean, like, <laughs> I'm gonna do it now. Yeah. <coughs> not COVID. Um, it's not COVID. <laughs> I mean, what is what is what is our intro? Um, Hollywood, do 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 Hollywood. Wow. <laughs> I think I'm punchy. I well, I definitely <laughs> am on four fingers of Nyquil, and also because we already recorded this show. <laughs> I know, and got eighty percent through it, probably ninety, ninety, ninety-five. And, uh, lost it, so that's why we're doing this non-live makeup. But otherwise, this show is always live. Yes, and the intro is m- movies now more than ever. <laughs> Now more than ever. Right, right, right. But remember the player? We watched it for this show. Yeah. And the slogan of the studio was movies now more than ever. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Sure. That's what I have to work with. Hey. Don't, if you are pitching uh, openings and you go, what is it? A podcast about movies? What about? <laughs> Expect to get that meme where the guy goes out of the window. Like oh, that's okay. All right. Three sure. people. One like, wow, do a rap. Somebody else. Oh, talk about your lives. Hooray for Hollywood. Okay. All right. I know. I know. I was trying to be funny, so throw me out the window. (laughs) Wow. Well, if at first you don't succeed, Mm -hmm. what movie did you watch? Uh, uh, We're getting right into it, huh? Uh, No. We we just faffed around for five minutes. Yeah. All right. Um, (laughs) We watched uh, the Philadelphia story. uh, Philadelphia story. Let me... Enunciate the title or so. Yeah, right. Um, so, where they uh, make a bomb? No, oh. no. Uh, so, what I knew about this movie was the stars. Uh, so, uh, Catherine Hepburn, Cary Grant, and Jimmy Stewart. Which, wow, sorry, talk Ruth about, Hussey. What? Sorry, Ruth Hussey. Yeah, I know. <laughs> fourth, fourth build. Um, oh, she was great, but you know, the three big hitters here. Um, and no. I. That's an interesting story. Oh, well. Because at the time, one of those was not a big hitter. Yeah. Actually, two of those weren't necessarily big hitters. This is a vintage, this is a pre-war Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. He's going to go off and bomb a lot of people and then like come back and not want to talk about it. Right. And then Catherine Hepburn actually was not doing well in the post uh, Little Women years, which also was directed by uh, Cukor, George Cukor, who directed this. Mm -hmm. And this was based on a play. Which I think is just obvious when you watch the movie. Mm. And it was a play that I don't want to say it was commissioned by Hepburn, but it was definitely immediately glommed onto by Hepburn as her return to stardom vehicle. Right. So she was in the play opposite Joe Cotton on, um, you know, on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And it was a success on Broadway. Um, pre-production was already beginning on the movie while they were doing the play. Mm -hmm. She got the rights to the play to make it do a movie thanks to Uncle Howard. Howard Hughes bought it for her. Right. And yeah, so this was all designed to return her to American consciousness and to successful films. Mm -hmm. And it did. It worked. Yes, it did. When you see Vin Diesel do The Last Witch Hunter and you're like, give it up. Pet projects never work. Uh, what do you just keep driving cars? <laughs> Maybe it's because Catherine Hepburn went, well, I'm not out of this yet. And right. hey, um, Howie, can you can you buy this for me? Right, right, right. And then the Philadelphia story. Yes, yes. And I, I guess I also knew that the brief synopsis of the film, which is wait, what we've established that the, oh, that's the, my you job. have to you have to do that. I will but make I, it very I was, brief. I oh. was that that part I knew. Go ahead. I'll make it very brief. Mm-hmm. Socialite Tracy Lord. Oh, I get it. Anyway, socialite Tracy Lord is getting married to 
Woo Win Wincy. George Kitteridge. Kitteridge. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't want me to keep going? No. Uh a guy who is um, you know, he's nouveau riche. Uh basically like if, if I could sum up this movie, poor people don't know nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh she comes from old money. He is a uh He's new money. Yes, he's from, owns a coal company and mm-hmm. started at the bottom, now he's here. But he can't ride a horse. What an asshole. Yeah, And know, right? her whole family's like, why are you marrying this guy? And she says, right. it's it's the right thing to do, and I'm so in love with him. Right. Uh, ding dong, it's Cary Grant. Yeah. Who is DZ Terwilliger, man. I can't remember his name either. Dexter? It, the last name is Dexter. Dexter, it's yeah. Like, I can't Dexter remember. shows it's like, up. It's like initials. He's her ex-husband. Too. Yeah. And they who parted the the acrimoniously yeah, yeah, after a short marriage. And it hasn't been that long since they've been divorced. Two years. This is a comedy of remarriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is very popular in the 30s and 40s because you couldn't depict an extramarital affair according to the Hayes Code. Mm-hmm. That was obviously relaxed because, you know... What's the first affair you can think of in a movie? Double indemnity? Uh, maybe, yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, but for now you can't. And so a lot of movies would feature people divorcing, then kind of like maybe kissing up or getting close to some other people, but then realizing at the end of the film that they love each other and getting married. And we'll okay. talk about that at the end. Yes. And so he wants to, we don't know why, but he wants to disrupt the proceedings. The wedding's going to be held at their huge estate in Philadelphia. So he goes to Spy Magazine, which is a rag. And the asshole that runs Spy Magazine tasks Jimmy Stewart and um, I already forgot her name. Ruth. Ruth Bassey to. Hus- I thought it was Hussey. Hussey to. Uh, and Shirley Bassey to <laughs> take pictures. <laughs> to go cover this wedding. And uh, he's a fussy guy and she's uh, kind of cold. And apparently they're a couple, but that never really comes up. Yep. And um, over the course of the several days uh, before the wedding, um, hijinks ensue and Catherine Hepburn's character Tracy begins to question her commitment and what she's sort of doing with her life and the pressures on her as a scion of this big family and Jimmy Stewart begins to question the prejudices that he has against the rich and Cary Grant just kind of hangs out <laughs> and just has fun yeah well I think we should also mention that that the newspaper guy what's his name kid had this story on Tracy's dad about an extra full of an undo. Yeah. An extramarital affair. Um, and, uh, so he's kind of using Cary Grant's character uh, as blackmail, you know, so he can get the, the, these reporters in there to get a scoop about this socialite wedding. Coercion or no, he still walks into that place. Yeah. I know. Ready to sell out. Catherine Hepburn and gets married to her at the end of the movie. Yeah, I know. So I'm confused. <laughs> um, that's pretty much it. I'll just say before you can talk again that uh, it does. It feels a lot like a play. Um, there's a I haven't seen the play, but there's a mistaken identity thing that I'm guessing probably went longer in the play because that's just that's what you yeah. do in a play, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, uh, set something like that up, but they kind of shut that down really fast. And there's a lot yeah. of crackling dialogue that doesn't quite time out on the screen and it's weird because you've got three of hollywood's most talented actors yeah um, bar none Mm -hmm. and yet it just there's a lot of places where it's like oh that a laugh line would be there we would have held for a laugh and then kept going like the rhythm of it never in my opinion really solidifies but i'm wrong because this is 100 percent on rotten tomatoes yeah i know um it's no Ipcrest file, <laughs> but it's 100%. It is 100%. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that the mistaken identity thing should have gone longer, too. Let's like... talk about something else, though. Oh, why? Okay. What, do you, what, what do you think about Tracy Lord? Um, I mean, I think she's... <sighs> honestly she's painted with really broad strokes she she's a, a wealthy socialite who is fairly self-centered you know and she doesn't we, see it that way well but we don't really know that much about her we know she likes to ride horses and not, what, she okay. what i think we know a lot about her i think like we get a, a very detailed picture of her as in fact I, I don't know if it's because Philadelphia's story does it so well or because it's all they've got. But in any future movie after this, maybe not anyone, but in a lot of future movies after this, you go, 
uh, two steps forward, two steps back, we come together because opposites attract, right? Mm. She's uptight, and he's a cartoon animated feline. That's all you get. And immediately you go, I get it. I get this character. She needs to loosen up a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. She's Orlando Bloom's character in Elizabethtown, and she needs a manic pixie dream Jimmy to come in and show her what's what. But I don't. I think that we get a lot of background on her. The problem is... She doesn't, you know, Jimmy Stewart is concerned about his job. Um, Cary Grant, I guess, is concerned about money because he's got to sell his boat and he's doing this deal for Zip or whoever owns a spy. Um, Everybody else has a job. A woman in 1940, before World War II, Mm. doesn't have a job. Mm -hmm. Now, she's rich. She may or may not take one anyway or be a philanthropist. But for her, it's just she's obsessed with how she sees herself, you know, and I don't think she even cares what people think of her. She's obsessed with her idea of herself as being this amazing person. Um, A great and really poignant, I think connection to this would be the episode of community that we just watched where Joel McHale's character, Jeff gets really upset because he can't make a pot in pottery class. Right. He flashes back to his childhood when his mother told him he was a special boy. Yeah. He was going to accomplish something great. Yeah. And he can't even make this pot. Yeah. Right. And I think that that's where we find Catherine Hepburn. I think there's a lot of subtlety in the writing. I think, especially for an earlier film, I think that she is, um, I think that she's mad at herself because her marriage fell apart and she doesn't know why, although she blames it on. Cary Grant's drinking and for a movie that opens with Cary Grant just laying her out on the floor uh-huh. like putting his hands on her yeah and then we learn later that he's a drinker uh, I don't want to like support that and say it's partially her fault I think that his uh, alcoholism is, is a problem in this yeah but she still doesn't I don't think that she uses that to let herself off the hook she doesn't understand why she isn't happy the way that she wants to be when she's got all these gifts the girl with all the gifts mm-hmm right um, I think she, you know, decides she needs to treat people differently, um, you know, throughout the course of the film. Um, and like who? Well, like her father. Um, <laughs> yeah, we never really wrapped that up either. Dad is apparently doing, yeah, doing yeah. showgirls in New York. Yeah. And it's just, oh, father, did I ever tell you that I love you? Yeah. Right. Oh, you make me so proud. Yeah, I know. Uh, can we wrap this up? I got a hot date. <laughs> oh my god. Um. Yeah, but I I don't know. I I'm not exactly sure what the movie is trying to. I mean, obviously she has to loosen up and everything, and she she kind of does through this extended night scene that we see. Um, but. Like, it goes in a completely different direction than what I was anticipating it to go in. Um, And, like, you know, I think her and George deciding to not get married, I think that was the right thing. But then for her, like, you know, Jimmy Stewart's character is, like, trying to think of her and, like, her saving face. And so he's like, oh, I'll marry you. And she's like, no, 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 no. You know, we merely know each other and blah, blah, blah. And also it would... Yeah, right. and it's weird because in a Hollywood movie, that's what happens, right? Yes. Uh, J- Joan Cusack. I wish it was Joan Cusack. John Cusack meets Kate, Be- Kate Beckinsale in a bookstore, and they're meant to be together. Mm-hmm. Bad example because then they don't get together, and he stays with Bridget Moynihan for a while. But the point is is that just because of some dumb meet cute that they had, right. clearly they need to be getting together forever. Clearly. And they don't do that in this, which I like, but... All the language and everything they show us makes us think that's what's gonna it's happen. gonna end up that way. Yeah, and there's never really a moment where he blows his nose too loud or right. really gets into these clearly communist views that he has about stuff. Uh, where she's like, nah, I don't think I like a guy with a boat. You know, it's it's just the alcohol, right, that makes her feel this way, right, and. You know, she's, yeah, she's she's hammered, but she's having a lot of fun. She is. And you want to know that she's going to have fun like that in the future mm-hmm. and not just marry Cary Grant and he won't pick his socks up uh, and, you know, and they just break up again in a couple I of know, years. I know, right? Like, and it was, it, I mean, I think it, they, the film kind of made it obvious that he was maybe still kind of hung up on her, 
But there was never really anything in the film that made you think that she was maybe still hung up on him. And... Uh, no, and his attraction to her just kind of melts away for the whole ending, like climax, where we get the confrontation with Ch- Ch- Chester Balls, T- T- Tiki, Tiki George Roo, Kitteridge. Kitteridge. Yeah. Uh, and Jimmy Stewart's just like, well, I guess I'll just stand over here with my uh, girlfriend. Yeah, who... right. <laughs> you ever watch a movie that <laughs> just made you think, man, I hope these two, I really hope they cheat on their significant others. <laughs> movie made me feel that yeah. way but anyway and then yeah. it isn't you know at the very end he's like oh well, I'll, I'll marry a tracy right uh but yeah but he there hasn't it's not like he has challenged kitteridge or seen uh dexter's uh you know interest in her still and no i was up until the very last maybe i'm dumb i don't know maybe i don't have emotional intelligence but up until the very like the last two or three minutes i was thinking huh a movie where you have two exes that have like a, by the end of the movie, a kind of healthy relationship. And that's just the way it is. Really cool. And then he's like, I'll tell you, I'm going to marry Get you. Married. It's like, what? I know. And then she goes for it, which is what I th- I think was the unbelievable Yeah, part. after that great speech by Jimmy Stewart where he says, oh, Tracy, Tracy, you got, you got hearth fires in you and holocausts. I know. And I, I, I was like, what the <laughs> you heck? You turned to me and your eyes were saucer wide. Yeah. Guess that you, yeah, that word used to just mean a big fire. Yeah, that's what you said. <laughs> but uh, yeah, now yeah. there's just the one capital yeah. H Holocaust. Yeah, yeah so. exactly. Um, yeah. It's 1940. It's 1940. I mean, so I can appreciate that she was like, uh, no, Jimmy Stewart, we barely know each other. I'm not going to marry you. But then <laughs> she turns around and is like, yes, Cary Grant, I'm going to remarry you. It's like, I got kind of mad because. I mean, it's like a happy movie in the end, and it's, you know, it's yeah, fun, even, and it's silly. He even talks to, I don't even remember the character's name, Ruth at one point, and is like, well, you know, it's it's tough for people who have, who are left alone. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe this So Jenny and, and Catherine, and then yeah. Ruth and, and Carrie, you yeah. know, but she's like, I'm good. It's like, you just quit the game, who wants to sleep with Carrie Grant? Yeah, I know, right? You just, an incomplete. Yeah. You walked off the field. Yeah, exactly. Um, why does she have to marry anybody? Just to save face? She already did. I, I know. The, the hardware store guy. Oh, oh, you're talking about Ruth. I was talking uh, about Tracy. Why no, does Tracy have yeah, to marry anybody? She could have gone out. Well, you know, we want to keep the to make the the titular Philadelphia story not scandalous. I guess. But then she ends up marrying her ex-husband Which in front of a scandalous. bunch of people who don't even know this guy. Right? And then another maybe a guy from Spy or somebody else gets a picture and it's still going to be a story. I th- she's that was so kid, rich. I she could have but she's so rich. She could have gone out there and went, "Thanks for coming to my wedding. Uh we've had a couple technical difficulties, so we won't be getting married today, but you'll all be back in a couple years." For my next wedding, because you have to, because I'm society and right. you you are blessed to know me. <laughs> well, I don't know if she's gone that far, but yeah. Um, the SS True Love. Yes, the SS True Love. <laughs> That's apparently well. there's a real boat. Uh, the, the ship is based on a real boat called the something but they changed the name to sf true love of course after the, the movie oh, okay and then it still sails i think it you can really it does tours yeah wow in the, uh, like cape cod area or something interesting like that. i wonder if it looks like the model that they had in the movie right that's yeah the model was yeah okay yes. all right all right anything good to say um yeah, i mean we've said good stuff I yeah just, it was fun you know I, I don't have any problem with older films fine no, but I, I, just, I don't I, either. I, I just I, tuned in and yeah. it's 100 percent. And I'm like, oh, boy, everything was, is going to work in this movie. Right. And you're like, Oof. I wish it was snappier. I, I, oh, I wish so snappy is. Well, shit. it's pretty snappy. But um, I think another film that came out around this time that also is uh, Catherine uh, Hepburn and Cary Grant bringing up baby. I think I like that one even more. So mm. that's a that's a really good one. I don't know if you've seen that before, but I have not. Maybe I'll put it on my list. Yes. If you want a movie that's real snappy, you should try. Here we are, born to be kings. <laughs> right. Yes. 
Highlander, yeah. 1986 Russell McCahey film starring Christopher Lambert and Clancy Brown and some unknown actor, a bit part player named Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I picked this. Although, what do you mean you don't know As soon why? as the canon films <laughs> thing came up, I was like, we're home. We <laughs> did it. Um, Shut no, it down. Cause, it all down. Because this is supposed to be, you know, nominally thing. You're watching films that you've never seen and want to see. I'm watching films just randomly. Yeah. But also kind of following a similar thing. I want to watch important films. Oh, never mind. I got it. This is an important film. <laughs> yes. Even though... Um, well, let's just say that I've seen this movie probably a hundred times. Sure. And I literally get something new out of it every time I watch it. Mm-hmm. I think that's great. What'd you get out of it this time? I learned this movie's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> this movie's a mess. I mean, there's a lot of ideas in this film. Yeah. So many that they didn't even develop a lot of them and left a lot of um, metaphor on the table. Mm-hmm. For, you know, sequels, TV show, all of which are roundly terrible. I mean, the TV show is okay. But, yeah, there are so many things that are kind of suggested by this film that the film has no time to follow up on. Mm. Because it's running, for most of the film, two concurrent storylines and two different timelines. Do you want me to do the synopsis? Also kind of... Oh, you have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for interrupting my my great thought. I'm sorry. No one will ever find out what was at the end of that. You can continue. We should have a light that you can hit when you're when you're bored, so the audience doesn't see it. But I know. Let's, let's wrap it up. Hey, I'm not bored. Prove you it. can continue your thought from before. I don't remember it. Ah, uh, fine. Uh so I don't even know what they're called. Princes of the universe, I believe. Really? Well, it's in the song. Well, yeah, I know it's in the song. <laughs> we'll we'll go with that, I guess. No, no, they're immortals. <laughs> okay. Uh, so are there are these guys that can sense each other and they have to fight each other and they're immortals. <laughs> wow, well, you, re- uh, we'll call you. Shut up. You are, you are crashing the pitch for Highlander. Whatever. Um, they. Picture uh, a wrestling match. Oh, you're going to make me start at the very Terry beginning. Terry Gordy. No, the fact that you haven't is, is good. Is good. It's a good sign. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, uh, there are these immortals. If they get their heads cut off, they die. Otherwise, they can't die. Um, and they can sense each other. And there's this thing called the gathering or the quickening. Uh, That's two different things. Whatever. The movie <laughs> well, does not I make can't that clear. Wait for your review. Uh, for I, it, do, it does. This is the quickening Highlander. Whoa! Come on. What you can sense. Come on. Things. And then the gathering is them coming together at the end. Uh, it, when when there are only a few of us left, yeah, we we'll okay. feel an irresistible pull to a faraway land. Okay, the time of the gathering. Mm-hmm. Two different things. You didn't see a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, heart, a bunch of deer in the middle of Central Park. Like, well, we're here. Like, now what? <laughs> wow, there's a lot of grass. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, there. So there's this guy in. Um, wow, you're just laughing at me. <laughs> Finish. Uh, Finish it. Um. So Connor McLeod, uh, we see him fight a guy and behead him at the very beginning. So you're going right back to the to the synopsis. <laughs> I thought you you did fine. I mean, people don't have to know about when he fights the CEO of that gymnastics company. <laughs> In the parking garage, do they? I don't know. Let's let's talk about the the major beats, right? The major points. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of magic. Yep. Uh, shit in New York. Mm-hmm. And if you stab yourself, a lady will have sex with you. Yeah, Highlander. Pretty much. Uh, also, a music by Queen. Yeah. Well, that, uh, that's yeah. It goes without saying. Yeah. This movie came from an idea from the screenwriter. Uh, he um, has a name starts with G, and I'm not looking it up. Uh, but he wrote this as his final project for uh, UCLA Film School. Mm, okay. I guess in his screenwriting class. Mm-hmm. And I guess the professor must have been like, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Because he turned around and sold it for 200 grand to Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And then also, I think, was hired to work on it. So mm-hmm. he also um, 
did successive drafts. And the original idea was it was called the the Black Knight or the Dark Knight. Okay. And he because he was studying abroad or, or had doing a gap year in Scotland, and he went to a castle and they had like armor on display, and he was looking at the suit of armor and thinking, what if the guy that wore that was alive today? Mm-hmm. Like, what would he think about the world and stuff like that? And that grew into. A movie that's close to this, but was much more courtly. It was about knights and stuff like that, you know, and um, just them never dying and and, um, being in the modern day. Mm -hmm. And later we worked it into uh, what it ultimately became. And um, I think that, uh, again, if, and from what I understand, that draft is very different than what we got. Sure. Like, it wasn't just a uh, find and replace. Like, a lot of elements are different. Mm-hmm. But the fact that there was so much in this movie, this movie is bursting with content. Mm. And we don't even, you walk away with a million questions. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what's the deer thing again? Like, why? They, right. <laughs> do they, they have animal powers? It never comes back. No. It's not like he, a snake comes in at the end in the no. last fight and bites Kurgan on the leg or something like that. No. But so there's a lot of, but I love that. I don't want everything explained to me. I love the the world that's created here, mm-hmm. but there's so much. And there's this history movie that happens and then a cop movie keeps running into it, <laughs> like right. T-boning it at the intersection. Mm-hmm. And now we're back in a cop movie right. where it's, ah, this coffee's terrible. All right, Brenda, give me what you got on the thing. And, mm-hmm. then, and then we've got that great scene where, oh, look, everybody, it's stock 80s character, a gun nut. Just I driving know. around. Right. That meant something a lot different back then. Yeah. Frank Miller's here, everybody. Oh, my God. <laughs> and he's just like witness to. And I feel like that only is in the movie to once again pull the cops back into the film. Right. Yeah, who yeah, yeah. we never see after that. True. But it's like we needed one more, one more cop scene. Mm-hmm. And this, I don't hate that. This movie is packed full of characters. There are a million things that could have been. Here's the results from the lab. That steel is old. But all the characters are like, you know, yeah, hey, I know, yeah, right? check that out. Yeah. Oh, man, we've got a real clean shave. Right. You know, everybody's something. Or she goes to the records guy and they're yeah. working. They're looking at the birth certificates. And and uh, at one point she's like, it's just cold in here. Did you guys use any heat? He's like, it's bad for the circuits. <laughs> And then he puts everything together with his computer program that didn't exist back then. That's right, fine. right. And he turns. He's, I don't remember if he takes his glasses off or not, but it's a glasses taking off moment. He's what you've got here is a guy who you know pretends he every hundred years or so he croaks and gives his money to another kid and so yeah, it's just like I, yeah, that's a what's that guy's story? Right, right. Or or the hot dog stand. The guy. problem with that is. It's a movie about immortal guys who cut each other's heads off with swords. I know. It doesn't. It shouldn't be about those people. No, it those shouldn't. Those people don't really matter at all, do they? No. And the movie never takes a stance on how we're supposed to feel, or more specifically, how the immortals feel about mortals. They no. have to live in this world. Right. And they're princes of the universe. Uh-huh. And at the end, he gets the prize, and he can read everybody's mind. So basically, he's like... The god of Earth, pretty much? I guess. And you never get, like, a sense... You know, we know that the Kurgan... Everybody re- reacts to this differently. The Kurgan becomes a complete nihilist. And mm-hmm. he just wants power. Yep. And nothing matters to him. Yeah, he's pure evil. And for, he's chaotic evil. And for some reason, uh, Ramirez decides that he wants to help people. Maybe it's because he has love in his life. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But he does say to Connor, when Connor is learning about his immortality that you, you have to leave a brother you know you have to basically leave heather go off mm-hmm. don't break her heart or, or it's your heart she'll die heartbreak over right your heart will be broken forever right 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 you know i'm 2500 years old and i've only been married three times because mm-hmm. you just can't take it mm-hmm. but other than that you never you know interview with a vampire goes into this People that live a long time. Mm-hmm. How do we relate to other people? And I feel like there's this is almost a vampire movie. Sure. Christopher Lambert walks around in a trench coat. Mm-hmm. It's like a modern day cape. Mm-hmm. There's a part where he goes to Brenda's apartment, you know, to have dinner with her, although yep. it's going to fall apart. And he's they're just standing there. And he's like, are we going to eat in the hallway? She's like, oh, no, oh, please come in. Like she has to invite him in. Right. And I, I wonder if this is extremely subtle or if it's unintentional. Or if it's part of a draft or an idea that just sort of got stripped out when yeah. they had to streamline, streamline the film. Right. Not that right, they right. literally are vampires, but when you think about having a movie about immortals, 
we have a long history of vampire fiction. Absolutely. So I think that that definitely, you know, gives you ideas. But... Yes, for sure. So, yeah, it's just like it's a mess. Like it's just it's a collection literally of really great, interesting scenes. Mm. But there's no real flow and there's no sense of tension. Connor is just walking around New York, right. meeting Castagir in Central Park. They're having a good time. Next scene, Castagir dead. I know. And this whole time, like, the Kurgan is, they've literally already fought. He's hunting him. I'll see you, McLeod. I'll see you later or whatever. Right. And they just, you don't ever really get a sense that he's really worried about stuff. It doesn't take any action to to get out of town, to get his girlfriend out of town. No. It's just a movie keeps going. Well, and, and then, then there's like, a climax. <laughs> well, with, with, with Castigier, too, like, uh, you know, here, here here's this guy who shows up. He, he's also an immortal. He's black and he wears a kimono. What's this guy's story? And then we talk about, he. they talk about, oh, remember that last time we partied? Oh, it was way back in the 1700s. And we get the flashback. Yeah, when you were my slave. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, we get a flashback to a duel, which was ridiculous and fun. But I wish we would have been able to see Castigier in that scene. Like, maybe he would have Oh, yeah. If you remade this today. Or, or there, like, we could have seen the party. You would have a whole G.I. Joe team. Like, if you did this today, there would be three um, immortals besides Connor. You'd, three bad guys, too. Right. And I think it, even in later um, ver- later sequels, they've kind of done this. But you would have, yeah, you would follow a, a couple different guys. Because the past, I like the past storyline, but it basically ends with any importance like once Connor once Heather dies and Connor yeah. leaves yeah that great shot where he leaves the sword there and then the, the house is burning and then when it's flashbacks it's just like color and up to that point you've got all these interesting transitions which I wonder like does, does Connor McLeod have to walk six blocks to find a, a Mona Lisa billboard so they, they can right. transition to the past yeah it's it's coming up here it's it's very soon <laughs> uh, it's on Bleecker Street um but then, yeah, but then once all that's over, then they just come in like, oh, you know, well, I know something about Jews. Or <laughs> they don't say that. but And then, like, the screen explodes like a bullet went through it and we're in a flashback. That's yeah. not in the American release of the film where we find out right. where Rachel comes from. And without that scene, Rachel doesn't make any sense. I know. She's just a, a secretary who really likes her job and doesn't want her boss to die. Right. <laughs> Which just adds to the overall general messiness of the film. And plus, Heather wanted a family so bad. So what I want to know is... Has Connor ever adopted anyone else? Like, he basically had the experience of having a family or having a daughter. Mm. And that's, like, significant to the character. That's, it like, is. important. It's really important. But instead, he's just going to, like, sweat and just run around. Take that trench coat off. I know, right? <laughs> he's and so then, sweaty. Like, he, he, like, when he says goodbye to Rachel, he's like, oh, you'll be set up for life, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, you know, Russell, whatever his name is, is going to... Russell Nash is going to die tonight and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's, it's not. It, yeah. But he he's not like, I'll be in touch. Or well, he gave like, her all the money. I know he did. He gave but, her like the whole thing. But he's we know he's not <gasps> probably going to die. So this like, is, why doesn't he keep in touch with her? This is the way. Well, we don't know he's not going to die. Um, no, the okay. Kurgan has killed everybody. This is the way into my Connor's secret room show. <laughs> At this point. And they will. I think they're already doing it. Don't do not do not do any more Highlander stuff. We mm-hmm. got it, right? Mm-hmm. We've got it. Yeah. There's already more bad than good. Stop. Right. But Christopher Lambert, still around. Yep. Oh, no, wait. We're going to use her. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Still around. Uh, if he's got the prize, he can age. So it doesn't matter that he's old. Mm-hmm. And we go into his little secret room and there's all these things in there. Yep. And what if they were all from, they're all mementos of some adventure that he had. Sure. So maybe he does go back to Rachel and they're cleaning the room out. And she's like, what is this? Is this a bear skull? You never told me about that. Oh, you know, it was a kind of magic or whatever. And then we flash back and we recast him as young. Somebody else is young, young. Connor McLeod. Yeah. And then that's how we do the anthology story, you know, through periods of history on a shoestring budget. Right. (laughs) It's all shot in Canada. Uh Uh-huh. You know how this works. Yeah. No. Why can't we have that? I think that'd be good. I don't know why we can't have that. Um, Maybe Clancy Brown could show up um, oh boy. in his mind because there's a thing that <laughs> I think the TV show introduces. Once again, so many. What is what is the quickening? Mm-hmm. What does it mean? Right. What's it do? Um, 
but the, I think the TV so, show suggests that the quickening is not only just, you know, random energy, but it's also the skills and power of sure. everybody you've defeated. So right, right, right. Connor McCloud, the good guy immortals are at a disadvantage because they don't kill indiscriminately. The bad guys like Kurgan, he's killed 200 people. Yeah, sure. Not all of them were lived long enough immortals. to become good swordsmen, but yeah, yeah, many yeah. of them did. Yeah. So you're already at a disadvantage. But yeah, just maybe um, – and also, I think there's a there's a question of like, do, do, do their personalities affect yours? So if Connor uh, absorbs yeah. the Kurgan, does right. he get a little bit of Kurgan in him? Oof. Well, you, the way you could exploit that is have old Connor McLeod and have old Clancy Brown, who is this voice in his head that has haunted him. You know? Yeah, yeah. You're weak, McLeod. <laughs> right? Yes, absolutely. McLeod. Uh... <laughs> Like that. It's better to burn out than to fade that's, away. That's my pitch. Yeah. Oh, boy. I, it's Clancy Brown. Let's just... The rest is all about Clancy Brown. Okay. Let's just talk about him our, our the whole time. Fantastic. So great. Um, and it's so great Yeah, that you love to hate him. He's so. So, there's so many big actors who... That's all they do, you know? They're just big guys. Tiny Lister, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's big, and he can move... And he's a fantastic actor, and he's yes. got a wonderful voice. And right. Gosh darn. And like, yes. he's had a great career. I mean, he has nothing to feel bad about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, he's great. Yeah, he, he was fantastic. I love when the priests, they they meet in the church, and obviously they can't Ugh. fight, you know, and then Connor's like, oh, okay, 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 no, I'm going to go. And everybody's scared, and the priest comes up, and he's like, so this is a house of God, you know? He died for our sins. And I wanted him to say... Amateur. <laughs> that would have been a great line. That would have been a good line. But uh, he does say, I have something to say. <laughs> yes. It's better to burn out than to fade away. As he spins around. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Um, I think you, we brought this up. Well, we've talked about this when we were watching it. But so the lady who Connor McLeod was kind of dating when he first goes off to war. Yes. Um, when... Connor McCloud comes back from the war and he's pretty much died of his it's wounds. Like Bess or something like that. Yeah. Uh, and then he comes back. She basically says he's the devil. <laughs> he's, he's got, got the, the devil, devil in inside him. him. Yeah. And then they like castigate him and like send him out. And then at the end of the film, when he kills the Kurgan, we see all these demon figures swirling yeah. around him. And oh, I'm you like. Mean- what the hell is he the yeah. devil you mean the deleted scene from fantasia yes where the cartoon demons come in yes yeah and the movie makes nothing out of that well we because, have never seen this before because i think you were kind of like whoa twist ending like he was the antichrist all along well, what is it no no, no that's not it no <laughs> that's a good idea though i know so yeah yeah what is the quickening and here's a here's a question yeah do you think so you know there are no window panes <laughs> and manholes in the 1500s. Sure. So when somebody uh, kills another immortal, uh, lightning? a lightning strike or something. Yeah. But in the future, everything's got to go. Yeah. And apparently that the scene where he kills Castagir, they had to shoot that. They did shoot in New York, but they had to shoot that in London. Really? And they had rigged all these um, windows to blow up in this building. And Russell McKay felt really bad about it because apparently they were... Um, it was all original glass. It was Victorian glass <gasps> in these windows. Oh, boy. And he's like, I don't want to blow up. This is like a landmark. And they're like, oh, they're going to tear this down in a couple weeks for a shopping mall. He's like, blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> so it went out in style. Oh, okay. Well, but I have there a, you go. I have a headcanon theory, and that is that the quickening, and it all goes back to that stupid scene with the, with the deer. Mm-hmm. The quickening is like a natural force, right? Mm, sure. Ignore sequels to this film. The immortals are, they are, you know, everybody is connected to nature, but the immortals are like the soul of the planet. They are connected to this animism, this this power, this force of nature that they're collecting. Sure. And man is just a virus that crawls around the globe until one of them gets the prize and becomes sort of the rat king of them all, you know, and, and can kind of guide them either to good or evil. Mm-hmm. And so the natural energy manifests itself as lightning but once technology and industry takes over and all the streets are paved over and we've got glass and buildings the quickening is almost reacting against that intrusion Mm. of artificiality into the natural world sure so it 
you know, blows up windows and blows off manhole covers and mm-hmm. makes cars jizz. <laughs> it's shot in a very specific way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what, you know, that's what it is. It isn't just that there were no cars back then. Like the car itself is like an abomination, mm-hmm. you know, to nature. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. No, I get that. You love that idea. I can tell. <laughs> Why is this a world where there's only queen music? Every time somebody turns on the radio, goes in a bar, is Queen the only band in this world? <laughs> Maybe they are, yeah. Um, There's a great story about how they um, they agreed to do, tentatively, to do the movie. Okay. And then I th- but they wanted to see it. Sure. So I think they put like a rough cut together or like a, a initial sort of draft. And Queen went in to sc- screen it and see it. And they came out and they're like, we'll do it. And then they got in the car and went home and they were like, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's kind of magic. We'll do that. And then it's like, oh, they're, they're princes born to be kings. And they had the thing written like and done like real fast. Oh, I can like, believe really it. really jazzed about the film. Yeah. No, I could totally buy all of that. Um, I, I think it's awesome. And you get excited with the Queen music like right away. Um, you're like, yeah, princes of the universe. Yeah. You know, um, just gets you really psyched. Um so I, I can't imagine this film without it. Would it make a good video game or would it be a <laughs> bad video game? Actually, yeah, there is a, a video game at, at Ness to it, isn't there? Uh-huh. Uh, you know, the levels uh, defeating yeah. certain opponents. And then maybe you have queen music the in the video game, too. Well, we were talking about Assassin's Creed on uh, Just Enough Trope recently. Yes. I mean, you could totally kind of uh, steal that sort of setting, you know, being in modern era, being sure. in a certain historical period. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, do okay, it. Okay, all right. Do it, cowards. One, one, more, <laughs> one more Highlander thing. Video yeah. game. Yeah. Do a video game. Yeah, exactly. It's probably been one and it sucks. <laughs> uh, save it for the end. Better to burn out with indignity <laughs> than to fade away yeah. is Sean Connery and Brownface. Oh, I don't want to think about it. Maybe he is. Um, if he is, I didn't really notice it that much. It's kind of everybody's thing in the film because they're all, it's like they cast a bunch of people, had a bunch yeah. of characters, and then they just went, yeah. pick one and put it to the other one and, and mix You're them all, all up. You're all mixed match yeah. of cultures. So Castagir yeah. is has a name that sounds like a knight, but he is a African guy that wears a kimono. Yes. With a sort of African patterned sort of. Yeah. Shawl over it. Yeah. And then you've got um, CEO of uh, Jim Cotta. Right. His, his name is like Ethan or something like that. He's got like a. Is he like Polish or something? N- like no, that? it's. Well, I don't know. Imam or something. It's uh, like a Middle Eastern name. Okay. And then, yeah, you've, and then you've got Sean Connery, who is Egyptian by way of Jap- Japan and also Spain. Yes. And Ooh. Connor's the one guy that's just like, yeah, I'm a Scottish guy. Right. With a French accent. With a French accent, yes. <laughs> There can be only one. Yes. And I I still can't get over, you know, him telling Sean Connery what Haggis is and <laughs> That's such a it's such a great you know well, there's a Haggis that you speak of. Yeah, exactly. It sounds delicious. <laughs> Here's an idea. If you're an immortal, join the space program. Let's say you live to when we finally get this Mars thing figured out, right? Sh- sure. Then you are, you know, hale and hearty in the in the prime of your life. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You'd have to do a couple of years in the military or as a scientist, right? And then you go to Mars, and it's like, come get me, Kurgan. <laughs> 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 now what? Yeah, right. They'd have he'd have to become maybe you lose your too. ooh to my theory. Maybe you'd lose your immortal powers if you left. If Earth. you left Earth, oh, well, when Highlander goes to space, to like all bad series do. Yeah, there you go. We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's great. Uh, it's a great movie. Um, oh yeah, it, highly recommend it. Not only uh, cinema is uh, is exceptional when it due to its construction, but also in the way that it makes you feel. Mm-hmm. And this movie makes you feel great. Absolutely. And it's, it's fun. I don't know why none of the immortals learn kung fu because <laughs> they're yeah, always losing their swords. Question. So step lesson two: uh, get your sword back, punch a guy, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, disarm a guy, use his sword. Right. But I do like the fact that for all the sort of hemming and hawing that the movie doesn't quite do enough about whether he can beat this guy or not, he just wins at the end. Yeah. You know, he's they have the whole thing at the Silver Cup Studios thing, and he's yes. climbing on the thing, and they're knocking the thing over, and they. Dump the old timey. Uh, can I get immortal? Get Legionnaires disease. Yeah, <laughs> the old timey right. uh, water tower over right. the most water retentive roof there's ever been. Yeah, and it's all just it's all just screwing around. 
if they just fought in a straight fight, which they finally do when they hit the floor of the of the studio or the building, yeah, he just wins. Yes, he's just that good. Like he's just they don't make a big deal out. Yeah, he's just better. Yeah, they don't make a big deal out of it, and I like that. Like yeah. the, the the guy that should have won won. Right, right, and lots yeah. of crane shots. Yeah, but <laughs> oh, also. I, oh, you did it, Connor! You, you you got the prize. Yes. Now help help me hide this body. I know. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's always a body left behind. Yes, uh, it's a problem. Oh, it was uh, fun. Yeah, it was fun. It's a it's a it's a good movie. Um, and uh, yeah. Are we supposed to make them fight? What do you mean? We always have make two the films. movies fight. Yeah. If, oh boy! Should we make Philadelphia Story fight Highlander? I think Highlander would win. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for true love, and I've got it with. Je- oh Splash. my god! Catherine Hepburn head lands in the pool. Whoa! 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 <laughs> that got dark real fast. <laughs> why? What? You, you talk funny. Uh, where are you from? <laughs> Lots of different places. Uh, he's got. There's always. I think this is always. Um, there's two rules in a um, Christopher Lambert movie. Mm. He's gonna suck on a titty, and also he <laughs> he's he's almost blind. Uh, that's one one B. And uh-huh. then he's gonna have really bad one liners. One liners that make Jean Claude Van Damme go. You need a better one liner. <laughs> and in this movie, it's. You know, he, I don't know what's what happened to him, but he's just off somewhere, and then she, Brenda runs in to try to help him. Very brave. <laughs> known this guy for... Great. I guess he can lay the pipe, because she's known this guy for like a week. But she's going to go up against Clancy Brown. And then Clancy Brown's about to cut her in half, and then Connor comes in and blocks it. And he's like, <laughs> what kept you? I know. <laughs> like, shaking his head. I don't... Okay, John that... Van Damme straddling two semis, just going... Mm, I on, know. On. <laughs> That's the thing that I don't understand is like, he's like dagger to his chest. I'm immortal. I'm going to stab myself. And we know that I don't heal right away. Um, <laughs> so we're going to make But a... now you're totally turned on because I've proved that I'm and immortal I'm by a huge bandage myself. on my chest. Yeah. <laughs> while we do this. Yeah. But let's do it. And I'm like, it's what? in e- It's in every film. It is bizarre. Every film, there's some. I don't. Some curly-haired girl who sees the, the ir- irretractable proof that he's immortal, and immediately we have to have near Just pornographic completely sex. Completely turned on. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, wow. Well, I have a knife wow. here. Uh, <laughs> Please don't. Okay. <laughs> well, I think that's it. Um, well, I'm glad that we. Uh, I was lo- not looking forward to this. To redoing this. Yeah, you never. You want to try to capture it. It's a kind of magic, but you never want to try to capture it a second time. No, you don't. I think we did okay. I think we did too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, no, no outro. <laughs> no, no, no outro. I'm going to go That's rest okay. and hope that this doesn't turn into a full blown something or other. Okay. And, sounds uh, good. We'll definitely be back in the future. Yes. To talk about more movies, both classic and modern for yes. your quarantainment. And until then, stay safe and stay healthy. Yeah.